Hi, it's Dr. Robert Seichert. Thanks for tuning in to episode number 23 of the Doctor Podcast Show. Today, I'm going to be discussing a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, and that is the topic of corneal transplantation. As you may know from my other episodes, I'm an ophthalmologist. I specialize in cornea and also specialize in corneal transplants. Uh, the history of corneal transplants is very interesting. In the early 1900s, there were a group of eye surgeons who realized you could transplant the cornea from one person who dies and donates their eye and donates their cornea into another person who has a cornea problem. There were many people who had either injuries to their corneas or had infections of their corneas or sometimes genetic disorders of the corneas who needed new corneas. The big problem was there was no way to find a corneal donor because there was no organization that did that. In the mid-1940s, there was a famous eye surgeon, R. Townley Payton, here in New York City, who had a great idea that instead of surgeons hunting for donor corneas, he would create what's called an eye bank. An eye bank is an organization that collects eyes and corneas from people who die and pass away, donate their eyes, donate other organs, and then those corneas can be given to surgeons who have a patient in need of a corneal transplant. So the first eye bank in the entire world was created by Dr. Payton with the help of some influential, wealthy friends that he had in media and in politics. This eventually led to the creation of many other eye banks around the country. There are about 100 eye banks now, which supply corneas to people who need corneal transplants. And in about 1961, uh, there was created the Eye Bank Association of America, which basically uh, helps all the eye banks around the country to get tissue. These eye banks now cooperate with each other. So if you need a cornea in New York and there is not one available, we can have one uh, from California that, that comes here. When I first started doing corneal transplants many years ago, we were unable to store corneas. They only lasted 24 to 48 hours. So most of my corneal transplant surgeries were done as emergencies late at night or on weekends. I would call the patient and say, we've got a cornea, come into the operating room quick. Fortunately, about 20, 25 years ago, uh, there was invented a solution that would allow us to store corneas for approximately a five to six day period. So corneal transplant surgery is now no longer an emergency, usually unless it's due to some trauma or some other acute episode. So currently we can uh, schedule uh, corneal transplants for patients, which makes it uh, much better for the patient uh, and the family. So today I invited some guests to join us on the Doctor Podcast Show who are involved in corneal transplants in various ways. And I'd like to introduce my, my guests. Uh, to my right here is Dr. Himani Goyal. Dr. Goyal is the chair of the Medical Advisory Board of the New York Eye Bank, or uh, the Eye Bank for Sight Restoration, it's known. Uh, Dr. Goyal uh, makes policy for the Eye Bank. There's a committee of other doctors, such as myself, and through her leadership, we make great policies which allow us to provide great corneas for uh, patients in need of that. Dr. Goyal is also a clinical assistant professor of ophthalmology at the NYU Langone Medical Center and also at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine here in New York City. And she's also the chief of ophthalmology at the Bellevue Hospital, which is the largest municipal hospital in New York City and one of the largest hospitals actually uh, in the country. So thanks for uh, coming today. We also have Mr. John Papanak, who's uh, been very nice to come today. Mr. Papanak has had corneal transplant surgery in the past. He's a recipient, and he's going to be telling us uh, some information about his experiences uh, with that. We also have Eduardo Gonzalez. Thanks very much for coming, Eduardo, today. We appreciate it. Eduardo is also a corneal transplant recipient. And he's also on the iBanks uh, Leadership Council, uh, volunteering and uh, helping with the iBanks. So that'll be uh, great. And we also have Maria Chelko here to my left, who's the communications manager for the iBank for Site Restoration in New York. And uh, we'll be uh, speaking with her as well.
So, uh, Hemani, I'd like to start with you. Could you uh, tell me about uh, corneal transplants? Uh, what kind of patients need corneal transplants and for what sorts of conditions? Yeah, um, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. It's yeah. really nice to be here with this group. Um, but as you alluded to already in the explanation, um, corneal transplants are, when you know, when you look at the eye, you see the colored part of the eye, you see the white part of the eye. The cornea is actually the clear cover over that clear, that colored part of the eye. It's the first surface that helps us to focus the light as it enters the eye. And any uh, loss of that clarity or its perfect shape will either distort your vision or blur your vision. And so any disease processes that can affect the cornea in that way um, could potentially benefit from having a transplantation. Um, corneal transplants have come a long way even, yeah. yeah, since I've been in practice. It's really amazing to hear your history about it too. Um, but so <clears throat> those conditions can include something that happens over time, like something that can cause the cornea to get swollen. It loses its clarity. Um, if you get an injury and it heals, but then the cornea doesn't heal clearly, um, or loses its perfect shape. Those are conditions that we can schedule a surgery, get, get the cornea transplanted. Um, and then in acute situations, if you have an infection that's threatening the cornea that needs to be replaced or a trauma. Um, so really those, those, those four major things come to mind. Right, I also have some patients who have genetic diseases like Fuchs dystrophy, which is yep. a common condition where the cornea kind of ages prematurely and they eventually uh, need corneal Exactly. Uh, transplants as well. And certain types of infections, for example, herpes simplex uh, virus infections. So I brought today a model of the eyeball. This is about 10 times the size of an actual human eyeball. Uh, the cornea is the front of the eye. It's the window of the eye. And the eye is the window to the soul, as we know. So normally the cornea is crystal clear. It's totally transparent. So it's like looking through a clear window pane and it focuses the light that comes into the eye. When a cornea is damaged or injured or has an infection, it becomes like looking through frosted glass window pane, like in your bathroom, you, you can see light through it, but you can't make out any images. And that's uh, basically where, where patients uh, need the uh, corneal transplant. What, uh, what is the most common condition that you do uh, corneal transplants for, uh, Himani? So that has also evolved since the beginning, right? Um, when I was in training, we were doing really only full thickness transplants. Right. And we did it for ev any disease of the cornea that needed to be fixed. We do full thickness corneas for conditions like keratoconus. Um, we would do it for Fuchs, the swelling of the eye, any of these dystrophies for trauma, for infection. Now uh, we can actually take the cornea into different layers and transplant different layers. And so that's really changed the game um, and the surgery a lot. And so for us, the most common that I perform now is called an endothelial keratoplasty, which is where we replace the inner layer of the cornea um, and for, for some of the most common reasons, right? Um, when we, we do cataract surgery a lot, there's patients who can lose that endothelial, that inner layer, the health of that inner layer from prolonged surgery or from even from trauma or anything like that. And so we're replacing that layer and that's probably the most common. Um, and then I would say secondly, it's, it's probably scar related from, from trauma or from infection. Right. So when I was originally <laughs> trained, we, we only did the full thickness corneal transplant, which is uh, very technically demanding because you have to take out the entire cornea mm -hmm. and then put in a, a new cornea. And then we basically sew the new cornea into the old cornea with a very fine stitch made out of nylon. It's called Tenno nylon, which is thinner than one of your hairs. Yep. And this is all done under a uh, microscope with about 10 to 15 power magnification. Yes. When I first started doing transplants, my patients would have to be at red bed rest for a few days. They'd stay in the hospital for about five or six days. Now it's become uh, outpatient surgery. Patients go home the same day. What kind of uh, anesthesia do you usually use for your corneal transplants? Well, if it's going to be a full thickness corneal transplant, we're still doing general anesthesia. It's the safest for the patient because, like like you said, it's it's you know it's um, the eye is fully open. Um, you know, it's usually a contained uh, 
organ. And once you take, there's no pressure. So really it's something that you, time is of the essence. You want to be able to get that chamber reformed. So the contents of the eye stay where they need to be. Um, so for full thickness corneas, I do general anesthesia as well. Make sure the patient's calm, everything is relaxed. Um, but for when it comes to partial cornea transplants, we actually still have the integrity of the eye. We're So we can do those under monitored anesthesia um, with a little bit of local anesthesia. Right, so the eye's numb, the patient doesn't feel anything. Exactly. And there's an anesthesiologist present who makes the patient kind of happy and relaxed yep. and mellow. And those surgeries can take about 45 minutes to an hour, sometimes even half an hour if everything goes yep. uh, very well and smoothly. Exactly. So that allows for a, a quicker recovery for the patient. The patient's uh, able to get back to their uh, normal activities yeah. Uh, much quicker, which is uh, pretty amazing. Just to give the audience an idea, the corneal transplants are actually the most common transplant done in the USA and the world. There are about 50,000 corneal transplants done annually in the USA. That's about 1,000 a week, and that's split up amongst about 100 eye banks. Compare that to other transplants, there are only about 25,000 kidney transplants done annually in the USA and maybe about 10 or 5,000 liver transplants, heart transplants, and lung transplants. So uh, corneal transplant aren't, uh, isn't as exciting as a heart transplant or a liver transplant, but there's actually much more of them done. Uh, one other thing I want to ask you, the, sure. the cornea is very uh, immunologically different than the entire rest of the body, which is incredible. Uh, so if you have a kidney or heart or liver or lung transplant, you need to be on immunosuppressive drugs the rest of your life. Otherwise, your body rejects this foreign organ. But tell us why with a corneal transplant, you don't need to be immunosuppressed after the surgery. So the eye is a very privileged organ. It's a part of our body, but it's actually extern like one of the most external organs. There is a direct blood supply, but as you get to the cornea, it actually becomes an indirect blood supply. So what we, it's what we call avascular. One of the reasons why we need to get a donor match for all the other transplants is because it's supplied by the blood and the blood needs to be compatible so that you don't reject the tissue. Um, and for corneas, we're very lucky and we call it a privilege because yes. we don't have to do donor matching because it doesn't have a direct, normally does not have a direct blood supply. Um, and so that is the reason why we can get away with, um, we actually use eye drops. It's a topical, instead of a systemic immunosuppressive, we use topical eye drops. Um, it can reject, um, you know, as there is a healing process sometimes, sometimes blood vessels will grow in that area in an effort to heal. Um, but it is uh, much less uh, than any other organ. And then as we get into the partial corneal transplants, the necessity for that immunosuppression is even less. And that's a huge benefit um, because of the side effects of immunosuppression in itself and um, also for the patient to be compliant with having to do drops every day. Right. It's actually really nice. Um, one of the other things that's really nice about evolving into doing partial corneal transplants is that when we do a full thickness, we are actually trying to manually recreate a perfect shape, which takes a whole lot of practice. Um, and uh, the nice thing about a partial transplant is that we actually have, we leave whatever perfect anatomy is there behind to use as our scaffold. And it makes our surgeries that much better. And it makes the vision that much better. It's actually, you know, it's it's been a great evolution to be a part of. Yeah, it's been great. So now we used to do full corneal transplants. We now do something called DSEC, D-S-E-K, which is an abbreviation, and DMEK, D-M-E-K, corneal transplants, which are this partial thickness, which allows for a much quicker recovery uh, for the patient. Yes. Uh, tell, as, as the chair of the medical advisory board, mm -hmm. tell us what the eye bank does to analyze donor corneas to make sure that they're good and appropriate and proper uh, so that the patient receiving the cornea knows that they're getting a good cornea. And by the way, you work with Patricia Dahl, who I want to mention is not here today. Patricia's been the executive director and CEO of the iBank for Sight Restoration in New York City since the year 2000, 23 years, went by quick. 
And she's done an incredible, outstanding job making this the, the leading eye bank in the world, I believe, and uh, she deserves a lot of credit. I also want to thank uh, Noel Mick for helping me uh, set up this panel today. She's done a lot of work to get everybody uh, together. So a shout out to Pat and Noel for really helping us with this. But tell us what's done in the iBank when the iBank receives mm -hmm. a donation. How do we figure out that this cornea is indeed good for transplantation? Yeah, so there's a whole lot that goes into it. We take you know patient history at the time of procurement to make sure that this is a healthy tissue. Um, and then once it is procured, uh, there's a battery of laboratory tests that are taken um, and the tissue is analyzed for how healthy the tissue is in, its, in and of itself. So the cell counts of each layer, um, the clear zone, all of those different parameters. And <clears throat> we also, it's, it's an evol it, that is also a process that evolves depending on what diseases are prevalent, what can be transferred from a donor to a live patient. So we make sure that the tissue is clean in that sense, free of disease that can be transmitted from one to the other, and that it's a healthy tissue. Um, and that's not something that we come up with by ourselves. You know, as a medical advisory board, there is an entire iBank Association of America right. that collectively collects this data. And over time, we actually change what those requirements are. Um, I'll give you an example. Like during COVID, we actually had to ask, you know, when the pandemic occurred and <clears throat> COVID was a deadly disease, it it was something that we needed to make sure was not going to be transmitted. Um, and then, you know, now that we have reached a different point with that, it's it's actually the, the parameters change or the protocols change. So uh, it's a pretty intense process. Right. And there are many technicians working in the eye bank doing all these tests on the cornea and mm -hmm. careful analyses to make sure that it's a perfect cornea for transplantation. Exactly. And one of the concerns my patients have that I'm asked frequently is, mm -hmm. how do I know this cornea doesn't have some contagious disease or virus? Right. Tell us what the eye bank does to make sure that we don't transmit any diseases from a donor to the recipient. So we do we do serologies on the patient, right, to make sure yeah, that blood those, tests exactly right. mm -hmm. blood tests, um, obviously history. So if there's something that's there that is transmittable, it's not even going to be offered as a donor tissue. If we don't know, we will process the tissue, but we will await the serologies or the blood tests to come back um, to make that final decision. Um, I'm not sure. Do you need more details than that? No, I think that that really establishes that we do an incredible amount of testing yeah. to make sure this, this cornea is safe. It's extremely rare uh, these days to transmit any kind of disease uh, from a corneal transplant because of all, all this uh, careful testing. Yeah. Uh, and the other doing. thing that's actually yeah. really important is that the tissue is followed. Like even after it's transplanted, we do a culture on the residual tissue. We call it the tissue rim. That gets sent for culture just in case nothing was detected before. And we follow our patients. And then we are actually required to send in six-month follow-ups on all of our patients, if anything happened later on that could have possibly been related to the tissue, whether it's an infection that develops or something that happens, a failure, a graft failure, we call it if the tissue gets rejected. So any adverse event is actually reported so we can go back and see if there's anything that needs to be changed in these parameters or the testing protocols. Right, and we also <laughs> have uh relatively frequent meetings with the medical mm -hmm. advisory board where all the eye surgeons come together and talk about their experiences and does anybody has anybody had any unusual experiences and there's a tremendous amount of feedback loop that yes. occurs so that we make the process uh, better and better. Exactly. So I want to speak to you, uh, John, <laughs> as you're a, a corneal transplant uh, recipient and can you tell us when you first noticed the problem uh, with your vision? Well, Sure. Um, I go, it goes way back. I was, uh, I was a young man in New York City. I'm, I've just had my 72nd birthday, so we're talking about 42 years ago. I was 30 years old, and um, I, had, I had been nearsighted since I was a, a young kid and wore, wore glasses. And um, I was starting my career in New York City. I was a sports writer for a big magazine called Sports Illustrated, way before they started employing artificial intelligence to write their stories. <laughs> they had human beings actually writing them. I was one of them. Um, and uh, I, 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 like many people, 
at that time, I wanted to try wearing contact lenses. So I went to my ophthalmologist and had uh, a, <clears throat> a contact lens uh, specialist recommended to me. And I went to see that person. And when he took the measurements for contact lenses, and these, again, this was the time when, before soft lenses, right. they were hard, rigid, plastic lenses. And he did the measurements on my eye and said for the first time, I had never heard this before, that you, you seem to have uh, a, a little bit of keratoconus. I didn't know what that was. It was explained to me that this is when the surface of the cornea, the curvature is no longer perfect, no longer spherical, like a beautiful beach ball or soccer ball, but starts to look more like a football. It's not a perfect sphere. So that the fitting of a contact lens, which was generally perfectly spherical, became a, a problem. Uh, but nonetheless, they fitted me with hard lenses. I, I took the time to get accustomed to them and wore them for two or three years without too much difficulty. But after about two or three years, I started to get a lot of irritation and I would have to take the lenses out and wash them and clean them and use drops. And it became more and more of a nuisance to me and started to interfere with my job, which involved a lot of traveling and renting automobiles and driving in the mountains. And, you know, one day I was driving in, in the mountains in California and my eye, one of my eyes was bothering me so badly that I really couldn't continue driving and I couldn't pull off the road. It was a real bad situation. And I resolved then to um, figure out what, what needed to be done. And the answer ultimately became, uh, you need to have a corneal transplant and all <clears throat> that you just explained, Dr. Seigert, was explained to me. I went ahead and had the first eye done. A year later, the second eye done. And, um, you know, at that time, the recovery period was pretty long. It was, there was, it was almost perhaps a year um, for each eye while the transplant was healing enough so that I could um, ultimately be fitted with new lenses. I still couldn't use spectacles, but by this time, I guess they had some gas permeable lenses that I could use. And so, I used gas permeable lenses in both eyes, and I did fine um, for some years. And um, um, over, you know, over the course of maybe twenty or twenty-five years, I I also then had uh, radial keratotomy, some reshaping of the corneas that had already been transplanted done, so that so that I would be more easily tolerate the glasses and ultimately what the lenses. But what I really wanted was to be able to jettison the lenses and go back to wearing spectacles. And ultimately, I was able to come get back my glasses. But then the results of that, of those transplants in 1981 and 82 were so great that 35 years later, I came back to do it all again. Because as I found out, like when you get a new set of tires on your car and you drive 50,000 or 30,000 miles, you wear down the treads. So um, I think it was kind of the situation where those corneas, as successful as they were, got a little worn down and a little scarred and were then again affecting my vision. So I went back and had a, a second, I think it was a full thickness transplant in my first eye. And this was all in about 2015 or 16. Full thickness transplant in my right eye, and it went fine. The left eye, a uh, uh, short time later, um, and we had, I think we did an epithelial partial transplant. And it took <clears throat> a few adjustments to get that right. But um, I'm sitting here now. My vision uh, most recently was uh, corrected with my glasses to 2020 on a good day, 2030 on a bad day. I can do everything I want to do. Um, I'm not hindered in the slightest, and uh, I'm a tremendous beneficiary of all the brilliance and all the genius of the of the technology and of the organizations of the Eye Bank and uh, all the procedures that have made this possible. I'm living proof. Um, of how effective it is and 
I, I give my thanks to everybody who was ever involved in all of that work, but I have almost perfect vision today. Wow, that's, that's an uh, incredible story. And during the times when you were having those vision problems, was that interfering with your career and lifestyle yeah, and activities? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, one of the, one of the motivations to, to find out if I needed a new transplant was not so much my work, but, but it was my play. So I like to play golf. And I was finding that I would hit the ball and not be able to see it very well. So you're you know. hitting it too far. Well, yeah. I mean, the worst part was to hit a perfect <laughs> shot right down the middle, and the people you're playing with go, oh, what a beautiful shot. And you're going, I wish I could see it. You know, it's bad enough when you hit it in the trees, you don't know where it is, but when you miss the beautiful <laughs> shot, that's kind, of, that's kind of depressing. So that sort of hastened the idea to see if I could clear out these corneas and, and start all over again. And then once that happened, I, I ended up giving up golf, and now I'm a, I like to say I'm a born-again jazz saxophone player. And I use my eyes a lot, but more than that, I use my brain and my ears. So they all work pretty well. I actually brought a sax with Oh, me. well. <laughs> Just kidding. I don't want to put you on the spot. Another time. But one thing that you mentioned that's interesting about having to have a repeat corneal transplant, when we do corneal transplants, uh, it puts a lot of stress on the cornea. So it's not like the cornea you were born with. And they can last 10, 20, 30 years. I have patients who still have the, the same cornea. But sometimes after 20 or 30 years, the cells in the transplanted cornea kind of give out. They age prematurely. But the good news is with corneal transplants is we can repeat the surgery with a very, very high success rate again. So I've had patients where I've had to do repeat transplants 20 or 30 years later. In fact, I saw a patient this morning where I did his original corneal transplants when he was 15 years old, a teenager. He had an unusual uh, disorder of the corneas. And I had to repeat one of his transplants last year, 30 years later. So his cornea also lasted about uh, 30 years. But again, that can be uh, repeated. And that's actually easier and safer to do than repeating like a heart transplant or other organ uh, transplant. So uh, the cornea is uh, an amazing organ and you're, you're a great. Uh, I'm a lucky guy. Yeah, you're, you're a very <laughs> uh, lucky guy. Uh, so, Maria, I want to speak to you a little bit. You're sure. the communications uh, manager for the iBank for Site Restoration in New York City. Yep. Can you tell us uh, what you do in your, in your role? Sure. Um, I've been the communications manager for, for a little while now. I've been the, at the iBank for six years, um, and I've held sort of several different positions at the iBank um, one of them was to be a hospital and community liaison. Um, so we do a lot of work at the iBank to educate the hospital staff who support the donation process. Um, and we do a lot of public education to raise awareness about the donor registry, the importance of signing up to be a donor, um, the benefits of corneal transplantation. So my role as the communications manager is kind of twofold. I supervise those hospital and community liaisons who educate our hospital staff. Um, and who work with the community to raise awareness. And then I also work with our communications team um, to raise awareness just more generally among New Yorkers about the, the donor registry and the benefits of, of eye donation. Right. So if someone wants to donate their corneas when they pass away or die, or let's say if somebody dies and passes away and the family wants to donate their corneas or their eyes or other organs, how do they go about that in, in New York uh, specifically, it's similar in other states, but tell us the process here. Sure. Uh, well, the, the best thing that someone can do if they want to be an eye donor is sign up on the New York State Donate Life Registry um, to be an eye, organ, and tissue donor. You is can there a website that. for that? Absolutely. You can do it at the DMV, um, but oh. you can sign up on our website at the iBank, iDonation.org. Um, so you can go right online and sign up. Uh, so that indicates your wishes to be a donor, and that is a legal consent to be a donor. Um, so that's the best way to indicate that that's what your wish is. And that goes on your driver's license, right? If you do it at the DMV, it does. But the right. donor registry is actually a database. So if I you see. have indicated your wishes at the DMV, that heart will be on your license. Um, but if you've indicated your wishes elsewhere, the heart might not be on your license. So the license itself is not the registry. I see. Um, so that's the best thing to do is to sign up and then to share with your family that you do wish to be a donor. It's important that you let people know what your wishes are so that they're aware. Um, right. If you pass away in a hospital setting, we receive a notification at the iBank um, where we can look up 
on the donor registry to see if that person who has passed away would, had indicated those wishes. So you mentioned your liaison with hospitals. So hospitals actually contact you when, when somebody passes away and they let you know, and then you investigate that and, and see if they're a donor. That's right. So we receive a notification from the hospital every time an individual passes away within our service area. And the first thing we do is we check that donor registry to see if that person indicated through the registry that they wish to be a donor. Um, we also evaluate them for medical suitability. We look into the medical chart and see um, whether or not that patient's a candidate for donation. And if they are a candidate for donation, we'll reach out to the family. So we reach out to the family to let them know that their loved one's on the registry and they're medically suitable. Um, or we reach out to the family to let them know that their loved one is medically suitable um, and they're not on the registry, but then it's up to the family to make that decision on their loved one's behalf. And there's a legal order of priority in New York for who can make a donation on their loved one's behalf. So when we reach out to families, we have two different kinds of conversations. One is to let the family know that this was their loved one's wish and they have um, provided a legal consent for donation and we support the family through that process. The other conversation is to let them know their loved one is medically suitable to donate and now they have that decision to make as a family about whether they think that's what their loved one would have wanted. And we have trained family support coordinators who work with the family through that process on the day the donation takes place. How is the, this gets a little technical, but how is the eye obtained from somebody who passes away in the hospital? Who removes the eye and how does it get to you? So we call them recoveries. Um, every eye donor um, recovery happens either in a hospital morgue in um, an operating room or in a funeral home, and it depends on um, the nature of the donation and the family's wishes where that donation takes place. The donation is always um, handled by an, a trained eye bank recovery technician. So it's our own staff member who then travels to the location where the donor is to perform that recovery in a sterile setting and with respect for the donor. Right. When I was an ophthalmology resident training, one of my things that, that we did was actually to do the recovery of eyes of people who donated their eyes, and then we would uh, have that delivered uh, to the eye bank. Right. So, yeah, so our technicians then recover that tissue. They bring it back to our ocular laboratory on Wall Street, where it's then evaluated, you know, under a microscope, the kinds of things Dr. Goyle was talking about. Um, to determine uh, in our laboratory whether or not that tissue is suitable for transplantation. And then we'll also prepare it for the different kinds of surgeries. So we were talking about, you know, different layers of the cornea can be transplanted. So we will prepare that tissue for our surgeons, um, maybe a full thickness cornea, but it might also be prepared um, in a thinner layer for whatever the transplant surgery is that's been scheduled. Right. One of the things you mentioned about donation, that we don't have to do any tissue typing of any type because the cornea is a special type of tissue. We don't have to worry about rejection usually. What about comparing mm -hmm. ages? In other words, if somebody's 20 years old mm -hmm. and they need a corneal transplant, what's the highest age of a donor that you would want to transplant into a 20-year-old, let's say? It's interesting. I don't know that I have a cutoff because I'm generally paying attention to the health of the tissue. <laughs> Right. I think um, on the on the flip side, a, a young cornea is not fully developed. And so that can be technically difficult to transplant. Um, but as long as the tissue is healthy, it doesn't really matter the age of the donor. Right. So the, the message mm -hmm. is we now can look at the cells of the cornea and see mm -hmm. if the cornea is healthy. If the cornea is healthy and has healthy looking cells under a microscope, we can transplant into almost any age group. Uh, in the old days, when I first started doing transplants, we didn't mm -hmm. have these uh, technologically advanced tests to do. Mm -hmm. So we would sort of have a rule that we didn't want to go more than 10 years above the age of the recipient. So if somebody was 30, we would use a cornea up to 40 years of age. Because if you have a 20-year-old and you transplant a 70-year-old cornea into them, by the time that person is 50, yeah. the donor cornea is about 100. So. But now with, with modern technology, age uh, doesn't matter as much. Yeah. And also uh, sex doesn't matter. We can transplant yeah. a female cornea into a male and, and vice versa. And yeah. it doesn't seem to make any difference. Exactly. I mean, with this technology, we actually can do cell counts on healthy live tissue. So we can see how little cells we actually need right. to have a healthy like cornea for our lifetime, our lifespan. So. Um, yeah, I mean, the technology has helped us in many ways. Amazing. Yeah, 
definitely expanded our range and, and has made more use of the tissues, more efficiency, less wastage. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, I want to get to you, uh, Eduardo. Tell us about uh, your story, how you first realized you're having uh, vision problems and, and what led to your corneal transplants. Well, thank you for having us today. Um, yeah, my so I, I think it happened, I want to say I was in history class. So I was 15 years old. This was 2010. Um, and I remember sitting in the classroom and I couldn't see the board very well. And it happened after I'd sneezed and I kind of rubbed my right eye. And I realized that I couldn't really see all that well. So I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, well, surely something's probably in my eye. So, you know, I got some tissues and I noticed that I couldn't see as well from my left eye. Um, so I, I ignored it like every young teen. I thought it, I thought it would go away. <laughs> right. Um, lo and behold, um, you know, a couple months later, I'm like, I couldn't see very well again. So I'm like, oh, you know, I wonder what's going on. So, you know, at one point I started to second guess what was really going on. I thought someone was moving my desk at the end of the day, and I was getting further from the, the board. Um, you know, sure enough, I eventually, you know, told my parents, you know, when, and we, we got glasses. Um, I think mm. my general ophthalmologist at the time, um, you know, we, we got glasses, but I, I don't think really they got to what was actually going on. Um, and, you know, six months later, I kind of mentioned like, hey, I'm not really seeing as well. And he's like, well, you know, you just got your glasses. It's pretty odd that six months later you know the prescription would change at your age so you know i you know we got a new prescription new glasses six months later surely this is gonna work um you know and about six months later again i wasn't seeing all that well again so at, at this point we decided to you know see a specialist and um i decided uh to see a couple people but i finally saw someone who i thought uh could help me and that was uh, dr zaidman at westchester medical so he diagnosed me with keratoconus um, and I had keratoconus in both my eyes, uh, but peculiarly speaking, my right eye was not as bad as my left eye. One eye was particularly bad, and it, you know, when we first went into the room, he told me, he's like, you know, just giving you, you know, an estimate of your eyesight, and I'm like, estimate of my eyesight. So he said, you're not, you don't see it a lot with your left eye. Your right eye is, is okay, um, but your left eye, you, you're not seeing a whole lot, and um, it's getting worse. It's like, it, and, you know, he asked me, hey, in a couple of years, you might need a, a cornea transplant. So I'm about 15. I'm trying to translate this to my mother, who doesn't speak a lot of English, and she's trying to wrap her head around that I possibly am going to go blind. Um, so she's, she's, there's a lot to take in. Yeah. Um, you know, the next yeah. day I was at a dodgeball competition and school was just getting, just ramping up for me. So, you know, he told me about the options. I got some hard contact lenses. Um, they took some time to get used to, um, but they helped a little bit. Um, and, you know, as the next couple of years progressed, I started seeing less and less. And it was particularly challenging because no one knew about it. I decided to keep it to myself. Um, so no one in school really knew about it, but I started to learn, you know, I wasn't good at certain things. It's kind of hard to play certain sports if you can't see all that well, I learned. Um, so I was not the first one to get picked for baseball because I couldn't really see the ball. Um, so I ran track and field because um, it's a lot easier running a circle when you can't see very well than it is to catch a ball. Right. And, uh, you know, I eventually, you know, got to like my senior year and I, eventually I wasn't, I wasn't seeing all that well. And it was towards the end of my senior year and I remember that, I, I'll never forget this day. So I walked into the lab and I'm sitting there and my ophthalmologist, uh, you know, he sat me down. And whenever I talk about this, I'm like, no one ever remembers all the letters that your ophthalmologist will show you. Um, but you remember one, you always remember the big E. The big right. E is the only one everybody remembers. It's the first one there. I remember I had sat down and uh, I went to see and I can no longer see the big E anymore. Big e. And I think that's when it really hit me that I, I wasn't able to see it much, as much. And I remember like hearing my mom like hysterically crying because you know my doctor is telling me like, hey, like Ed is now legally blind out of his left eye. His right eye is not not bad, but it's not great. And you know he's he's now legally blind. Um, so you know we're gonna have to talk about like you know a couple options about you know what's gonna happen. So I was. Uh, you know, I didn't know it at the time, but there was a lot of wonderful people working behind the scenes to help my situation. Um, and I would later meet them, and some of them are in this room. Cool. So um, there was a lot of great people working at the eye bank to work behind the scenes with the hospital, with my surgeon, to help procure the cornea that would then help 
you know, me restore my sight. Um, so I did my first year, first semester in college. We kind of prepared for my surgery, and then it, it basically happened two weeks after my, my first year at RPI. I went to Rensselaer, um, and um, I remember, you know, it was a it was a pretty monumental feeling because um, we're talking about the surgery, we're talking about what could happen. My parents are there, um, and you know, we had a great team. Dr. Zayman did a fabulous job. Um, I remember we got the surgery done, and uh, I remember waking up the next day, and it was a little painful. Um, to say the least, uh, the recovery definitely took uh, a couple. I was definitely at the hospital, I think, like a couple of days. And then I remember for that summer, the rest of my summer was, you know, a lot of frequent visits with Dr. Zaidman. Um, but, you know, eventually, uh, about six to eight months later, uh, recovery is going well. Um, he actually performed LASIK on me afterwards. And it, it the best way I could tell anybody is, when you get out of the shower and it's like fog and you can't see anything and, and you wipe away the layers and you can finally see, that's what it felt like. Mm -hmm. It felt like I could see again. Um, and it, you just wiped away everything. And, you know, he was telling me about all the things. And it was almost like reteaching myself how to see because um, I had new depth perception, I want to say. Um, right. And I would constantly miss things, um, little things, but I, I would actually miss things. Because for so long, I think my body found ways to accommodate for my lack of depth perception when I was in high school that um, it, it was almost like sight therapy. Hmm. That's an incredible story. So the fog just kind of lifted and, and you're able to see better. Correct. Yeah, the depth perception is interesting because you need two eyes to get depth mm -hmm. perception to allow you to judge distances. Yep. And when the vision in one eye is severely reduced, uh, you lose that. So sometimes you're pouring tea and into a cup or coffee and you miss the cup it's yeah. more difficult to park your car and and things like that so that that's an amazing story yeah. now i understand you're also a saxophone player yeah right? actually <laughs> um, i was a sax i was a saxophone player in high school i played uh, jazz um coincidentally um and i thought charlie parker was great his music is fantastic. Um, I, yeah, I played the saxophone in high school, but uh, talking about things that I could do pre and post uh, operation. So it wasn't until after the operation I realized how abnormal not seeing was. Um, and I realized that all the challenges I had to go through weren't something that most people actually went through. Um, and I remember, uh, <laughs> I remember vaguely, so I did pretty well in school. Uh, at least well enough to you know to go to university and not make my parents worry too much. But I remember not being able to see all that well. So what I would do is at home I would read the textbook pretty close to my face, as and I would read it twice. Um, mm -hmm. So I developed pretty good memory. But I did that. So if I was called on in class, I wouldn't. I didn't see the board. I didn't have to. You know, I didn't have to read it. Uh, but that also I also got pretty bad migraines um, from reading that. But I realized that it wasn't something that was normal. Um, and then I realized that like not being good at ball, like, you know, uh, sports are required hand-eye coordination. I realized that wasn't normal either. Um, and progressively, uh, you know, I learned a lot of other things, but you know, there were things that I I'd love to do that I felt like towards the end of, you know, me seeing, I couldn't do as well as driving was one of them. I always loved driving. And I, you know, I, to this day, what I do is a couple of friends and I, we will fly to a different place. We will rent a car and then we'll have a road trip there. Um, mm. And, you know, we do this every year and I, I strongly feel like I wouldn't be able to do that if mm. I uh, if I wasn't able to see. Right. Now, you're also on the leadership council of the iBank for Site Restoration in New York City. Can you tell us about that, what you do with yeah, that? Yeah, of course. So I think um, I was introduced to the iBank um, a few years after the operation. Somebody reached out, and it was actually Maria. It was me, yeah. <laughs> she reached out to me asking if I would share my story. Yeah. And at that point, I said, yeah, of course. So, you know, we got together. We it was during the pandemic. We got together over Zoom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. That's, I just want to interrupt. The iBank yeah. was running during the pandemic, still providing corneas for people who needed them. Yeah. Thanks again to uh, Pat Dahl, who worked through the pandemic and made sure the iBank was uh, continuing yeah. to run, even those through those times. Yeah, so tell us about that. Yeah, we, we got introduced. Uh, we did a video. Um, you know, we, I met the team um, over Zoom. Um, I wouldn't meet them until a little bit later. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, we met. We talked a little bit about what, you know, what happened. And I shared my story. And eventually, you know, I started 
um, going to more events at the iBank. I wanted to be involved. Um, I think I felt like I almost had an obligation to tell people my story and just to relate to one another a little bit better because every time I share my story, there's almost always somebody in the room that will say, I know so-and-so that either had uh, a, you know, a transplant of some sort, a cornea, if not something else. So it, it touches a lot of lives. Mm -hmm. um, so I felt like it was almost like my obligation because the gift of sight is something I will never take for granted. Um, so in sharing the story, I actually realized that a lot of my family actually has keratoconus. Um, mm -hmm. And I had uh, two other relatives that also, you know, had a, a cornea transplant. Um, but I actually realized that there's probably at least half a dozen individuals in my family who, you know, are currently, um, you know, working towards finding, uh, you know, how it's severe it is in their circumstances to see if a coronary transplant is viable. But um, mm -hmm. I actually developed a closer relationship with some of my family members because um, a lot of us didn't, I guess a lot of us were going through it, but a lot of us never talked about it to one another. Mm. Right. So both of you mentioned keratoconus. If people want to look that up, it's spelled K-E-R-A-T-O-C-O-N-U-S. This is a condition of the cornea where instead of it being smooth and round, it becomes football shaped, as you mentioned, John, and then the light uh, doesn't get focused. In my practice where I see a lot of keratoconus patients, I would say about 10 or 20 percent of them have a family history of a sibling or a parent or a cousin or somebody but about 80% have no history at all. What, what about you, Humani? Do you, what do you find yeah. with your keratoconus patients? I mean, I think it's like so amazing to hear you go through this process and tell us about it because this is the thing about keratoconus or, or children who go through um, things that are not abnormal. Children don't know. And like to them, if it's something that they've been going through, like they have no comparison of what things used to be. Like for you, you were 30 years old and like you had great vision and then you realized, right? But for Eduardo, he was so young that he didn't even realize until after the fact. Um, <clears throat> and so with keratoconus is why it's so important with, with any disease, but eye disease, it's to get it checked, to get screened. That's why we do vision checks in schools to make sure because the children won't know and we pick it up. And then, and a lot of times the parents are very surprised too because they're like, oh, but my child never complained about anything. How could this be? Um, and so it's, it's very important to raise that awareness. I'm really glad that you're sharing that part of your story right. um, because also with keratoconus, we have come to a point where if we catch it early enough, we can maybe avoid corneal transplantation altogether. Right. And so that is a huge part of the goals is, is prevention. Um, and yes, it does run in families. So um, being able to screen for it. And once you find out, you always say, get your brother in here, get your sister, you know, or if it's an adult, like your children, like growing up, just to be able to have that on our radar so that, you know, if we get get them early enough, we can cross link, we can strengthen the cornea before it even reaches a point where it's it's gotten thin enough to, to lose its strength and then become so distorted that we need to replace yeah, it. Yeah, great point. Uh, I think keratoconus is one of the most <laughs> common conditions that lead to corneal transplantation. And there is a procedure called collagen cross-linking, mm -hmm. which kind of strengthens the cornea. And if you pick it up earlier, you can prevent the cornea from deteriorating. Mm -hmm. That's that's something that's new, which, uh, yeah. which wasn't yeah, available sure. uh, in your days. We mm -hmm. think it's a genetic condition because mm -hmm. of this familial thing, but again, many of my patients, most of them actually have no family members. So it's not mm -hmm. really clear how right. you get keratoconus. And it can be, you know, it can be at different levels. Like there might be right. a subclinical, we call it subclinical, meaning there may be someone that has glasses or like a strong prescription, but their vision's good with that and it doesn't technically get to a point where they need to have a transplant. Um, uh, yeah, and you know, even worldwide, like the access to being able to get this into um, the villages where we have little mm -hmm. kids who don't necessarily get screened. There's actually so much that's going on to be able to screen for these things. There's a new app, like there's multiple apps right. on, on, on our phone that we could actually take, you know, pictures of children um, all over the world to get them screened and get them. Yeah. I was thinking the two of you maybe should get together for the <laughs> corneal <laughs> transplant <laughs> <or> <laughs> band. Jazz orchestra. Right, corneal, corneal transplant. Tra that will 
talent we, group. We need, play, to get a cornet yeah. player. we need to get a cornet player involved. In I can sing. Okay, well, you know, we'll get a cornet player. I can dance. There you go. There, we got the whole band. <laughs> I, I think Ed alluded to this, but, you know, one of the things we do in the communications department at the iBank is we reach out to people like Ed, you know, to people like John who have received transplants, and we, um, we, you know, talk to them about their stories. Sometimes we record videos of them sharing their stories. Yeah. We write articles about them and try to raise awareness about the benefits of cornea transplantation so that, you know, maybe a parent whose child is experiencing something like you describe um, might see that video and then go see an ophthalmologist or just so that someone who's signing up on the donor registry would understand that they're becoming an eye organ and tissue donor and what the benefits of eye donation might be if they do yeah. end up hearing from the eye bank to understand, you know, that they're impacting the lives of people that they've actually seen before. So that's a big part of the work that we do to just raise awareness about the importance of um, of donor registration in general. To what if someone would like, like to donate funds as opposed to, I mean, I, I don't even know whether my eyes, with the history that, that I have, would be suitable for donation. I, I'm, I'm, I'm ignorant of my own circumstance. I, don't, I, I would doubt that my eyes would be of very much use except for possibly research. But sure. suppose someone wanted to donate some money. So the iBank for Sight Restoration is a nonprofit organization. We do accept charitable contributions, absolutely. And those help to underwrite some of that communications work that I was talking about. Um, we do a lot of work with Donate Life New York State uh, to educate DMV staff, members of the public, um, and just to do a wide variety of um, both clinical and public education efforts. So we, we absolutely accept charitable contributions through our website, idonation.org. We're also on social media at iBankNY. Um, it was just Giving Tuesday, so we have some different campaigns that you can check out there. And then the stories that I've been talking about are shared through our social media platforms as well. Right. So if you want to donate funds, you go to idonation.org, which is E-Y-E-D-O-N-A-T-I-O-N.org, and you can uh, donate funds and find out more information about uh, donating your eyes and corneas. Uh, that's a good question you had, John, about whether yeah. your eyes can be yeah. used. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. we wouldn't be able to use your corneas because they've gone through surgery, and so they're kind of stressed, so we wouldn't use them as donor tissue. But we could use other parts of the eye for research. Can you tell us about right. that, uh, Maria? Absolutely. Um, so we work with a wide variety of researchers who are looking into treatments and cures of different kinds of blinding eye diseases. One particular project that we're excited about is um, culturing retinal pigment epithelium cells. These are the cells that kind of support the rods and cones of the eye, and that research mm -hmm. might one day lead to treatments and cures of age-related macular degeneration. So even if tissue can't be transplanted, we can hopefully place that tissue with a researcher um, who can contribute to maybe many, many more people being able to see in the future. Right. Those cells, the retinal pigment epithelial cells, are all the way in the back of the eye in the retina. It's a different part of the eye. And we're working on creating stem cells from those that can then be injected into the eyes of patients who have various retina problems, especially macular degeneration, uh, possibly retinitis pigmentosa, which is another retinal disease. So uh, even if your eyes are not suitable for uh, donation to another person who needs a cornea, other parts of the eye can be used. So don't hesitate mm -hmm. to, uh, to donate. Right, yeah. we want to honor everyone's gift. So if we recover tissue and we find that it can't be transplanted, then we'll seek to place it with a researcher to honor that person's uh, wish to restore sight, at least at some point in the future. Yeah. And in, in addition to um, the funds going to research and to also providing the tissue that we actually use for our surgeries, <clears throat> the eye bank is also involved in teaching. So mm -hmm. because all of the cornea uh, specialists of New York, actually, we are together, we take turns being on the medical advisory board, we keep in touch with each other, we train each other as well. So when it comes to a new developed technique, like for example, the endothelial keratoplasty, that partial transplant of the cornea, when it came out, it was Dr. Florakis who was the chair of the medical advisory board at the right. time who held the first sweat lab that we had. And mm -hmm. that's how I learned how to do that surgery. Um, and so now we actually annually have a fellow's wet lab. So um, we, we train other doctors as well. And then we also um, provide um, scholarships for mm -hmm. research for our fellows so they can apply for that. So a whole lot happens. And we've been bringing ophthalmology residents funds. into our labs yeah. mm -hmm. um, to just familiarize them with our procedures early on uh, in their careers. 
So, yeah. so it's a huge educational uh, component. Absolutely. We also well. educate all the clinical staff and administrative staff in the over 60 hospitals in our service area who, you know, work with us to facilitate the eye donation process. Right. Uh, one of the concerns that some of my patients have had um, who were interested in donating is they were concerned about disfiguring the, the body if, if eyes are sure. removed. Could you tell us a little bit about that? This is a common concern that maybe we won't be able to have an open casket you know, funeral service for our loved one if they're an eye donor. Um, open casket funeral should absolutely be possible if someone has been an eye, organ, and tissue donor. It's very important to all the accredited recovery agencies involved that the choice to donate doesn't impact at least that choice specifically doesn't impact the ability for the family to celebrate their loved one's life with an open casket. Um, so it should, you know, just look like that individual has their eyes closed, that they're right. at rest, just like we're used to seeing um, in an open casket service. Um, the choice to donate is also confidential. So no one should be aware that it has occurred. You know, if you're there with the family of the loved one at their funeral, um, you would only know that they've been a donor if the family chose to tell you. Right, so nobody would know. It also doesn't impact the timing of a funeral. Eye donation is very time sensitive. We recover, you know, quite quickly, and so we don't uh, delay funeral arrangements. And that's actually something we, we survey donor families to make sure they've had a meaningful experience with donation and that it didn't delay their funeral arrangements. All right, that's very important. Patients ask about that. What about uh, religions? Are there issues with that? Are there certain religions that don't allow donation of organs or recipients uh, who can't get organs? All leaders in all major religions support eye organ and tissue donation. And what we say because we're not faith leaders ourselves is that, you know, individuals should reach out to their own faith leaders because certain groups of people within a faith um, might have different beliefs about donation. But in general, leaders among all major religions do support donation. Well, that's good to know, right? Yeah. We touched earlier a little bit about the I uh, Bank Association of America and uh, mm -hmm. how that organization is very important in connecting the roughly 100 I banks around the country. Because I know occasionally I needed a cornea and there was none available in the New York metropolitan area, and I wind up getting a cornea from Texas that gets shipped. <laughs> right. And several of the airlines actually donate their services to uh, ship corneas across the country. Right. Can you tell us about more about the iBank Association, how that works with the different iBanks and what the benefits and advantages of that organization are? Sure. So the iBank Association of America is sort of the governing body over all of the accredited nonprofit iBanks in the country. Um, and it's a place where we can share ideas with each other and things like that, but it's also um, kind of a network of eye banks so that in the event that we, you know, have a surgeon who needs a tissue here in New York and we, for whatever reason, don't have that tissue to provide to them, we can reach out to one of the member eye banks um, and they can uh, provide tissue to us that we import to our states. So we do domestic imports and exports to each other. Um, and that way we can then provide, if we have a surplus of tissue, we can reach out to our friends at other eye banks and provide them the tissue that we have. Because as you mentioned, we can put it in that preservation media for about a week or so. Right. Um, but we want to, you know, honor everyone's gift and make sure that transplantable cornea tissue goes to a recipient. So we can offer it out to other states or we can request from other states um, tissue if we're in need of it. So we can import and export to each other in that way. And the iBank Association of America helps us to kind of trust each other and understand that we all have the same values. We're all regulated by the FDA. Um, so right. we have the same standards. And that way we can work together in a collaborative way. Um, and we all agree upon, um, you know, the, any innovations that we're all accepting, any, any um, thing like the COVID pandemic where we're going to kind of change our standards for a period of time to be more careful. We're doing that all together. That's an important point. Also, I'm glad you mentioned about the FDA. Everything, all the policies in the I, New York I Bank and the other I Banks right. is regulated very carefully by the government and the FDA so that everything is extremely safe yes. and done according to proper protocol the to other prevent thing problems. I'd like to mention about something being regulated is the donor registry itself is also highly regulated um, and highly secure. We get a lot of questions about who can access the donor registry if you've made that decision? Can the hospital check? Can an EMT check? Are we looking in my license to see if there's a heart there? Does this impact my medical care? Are a lot of the kinds of questions we get about the nature of the donor registry. Um, but it is a highly regulated database. 
we can only check if someone's on the registry if we have received a referral from the hospital that that person has passed away. Um, then we can look up their name. And we, as an accredited recovery agency, have access to that registry, but the hospitals do not. Other organizations do not. Um, if you call the iBank and say, hey, I signed up at the DMV, can you just make sure I'm on the registry? We are not allowed to look up your name. Um, we can walk you through that process online, but you have to do it yourself. We can only look you up if we've received a legal referral from the hospital. Um, so it's a highly secure and confidential registry. That's great to know. So privacy is very uh, Exactly. It's protected. a part of your protected health information. All right. That, that's pretty awesome. Uh, John, Eduardo, any other comments you want to make uh, about? Well, I, I would just like to say <clears throat> I'm so grateful for all the work that the folks, the organizations that you all represent have done. And, um, uh, you know, I, it's all fantastic. And um, I want everybody to know how yeah. great this work is. And I'll do everything I possibly can to help promote it to everyone I can. Thank well, you. Yeah, we appreciate coming. How about you, Eduardo? Echoing the same sentiments, again, like growing up, going through a lot, it was really challenging, but knowing that there is a whole group of people in my corner rooting for me, making it as seamless as possible so I can see again is something I will never take for granted. So if we can keep letting people be aware of the privilege it is to be, uh, you know, to donate, uh, you know, we will keep doing that. Well, that's yeah. great. I want to thank everybody uh, for coming today. This has been very educational for me, uh, as well as everybody else here. And I'm sure the audience will like this program as well. Learn a lot from it, enjoy it, and benefit other patients out there who may need a corneal transplant in the future. Thank you for uh, watching.